On the seventh episode of RGSL Chat Chamber, we welcomed Martin Schirsch, who is a visiting lecturer at RGSL. He is also a PhD candidate in politics at the University of Latvia. While studying at NYU, he was on a permanent mission of the Republic of Latvia to the United Nations as an intern. Currently, he is an associate scholar at the Center for European Policy Analysis. This episode is mainly devoted to the events taking place recently in the United States, as the Capitol Hill riot, Trump's second impeachment, and in general about Trump's term in the office. So this is the seventh episode of the RGSL Chat Chamber, and we are very, very happy to welcome Martin Hirsch. He is one of the visiting lecturers at RGSL, and he is a PhD candidate in politics, right? Um, I think it is of importance to remind all of our listeners that we are here together with Christopher's and mm-hmm. Mart as well. This will be an interesting interview because... Uh, because of your experience in, in USA, as well as thorough insight in, in how information spaces uh, work and, and how people are being drawn to them, as well as uh, you can have, I think, a very, very interesting opinion here uh, on very topical issues such as U.S., as always. <laughs> yep, and there's a lot of stuff happening in U.S. recently. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Who would have thought, maybe some of people have thought about this uh, coming at some point, maybe not in this specific uh, point of direction, but something is going to happen. I think that some people actually felt that coming. Well, um, some, some people were afraid there's going to be a civil war after after elections, <laughs> so uh, there was a spectrum of kind of, kind of possibilities. Uh, and uh, I'm not that surprised that there was uh, there was a uh, a mob or insurrection in the United States because because if you have a U.S. president which has been talking for uh, more than four years uh, about essentially deep state about um, basically how Democrats are evil uh, how we should fight protect the poor Trump who's been ostracized and bullied by evil Democrats media and by everyone NATO as well uh, it, it leaves a mark people can listen to what president says people listen to essentially disinformation and it leaves a mark. It's, uh, it is very naive to think that uh, you can have a president of the United States uh, spotting this information and kind of inciting people uh, against the states, and it will leave no mark. Uh, and there have been a lot of things that Trump has changed. For example, uh, Republicans, uh, some, some five, six years ago, there was a survey, uh, and, and a couple of years ago, a survey on what they think about Russia. So Trump, he's been very pro-Russia, very supportive of Putin. He likes uh, uh, his, his, his macho buddy. And uh, Republicans uh, have uh, become more essentially pro-Russia. So, uh, so five, six years ago, roughly 20% of Republicans said that Russia is a partner, ally. Now it's uh, more than 50% of Republicans could think that Russia is a good guy. And uh, throughout these last four years, uh, so Russia has poisoned Navalny. Uh, Russia has essentially, uh, well, not been a good actor in international arena. So it's, it's, uh, so U.S. president, what he says, what he does, leaves a mark. And I'm not that surprised that his uh, essentially hateful rhetoric has uh, caused a, um, this uh, insurrection and a mob assault on a um, U.S. Congress. But what specifically in this situation is the new sentiment in, in, in the behavior of U.S. president? Because we can, I, I think there always has been some kind of a, you know, this uh, pointing with fingers, right? Uh, who who does what, who is the bad ones, and, and Republicans versus Democrats. And so what is new in this situation? Yeah, well, if you look at the last four years, uh, so then there have been these, these fact checkers uh, who looked at what Trump says, so essentially roughly half of what Trump says, it's, it's lies, it's exaggerations, it's, it's essentially not true. Uh, and uh, at the same time, so Trump lies constantly, but there is a group of Republicans, a majority of the Republican Party, which supports Trump no matter what. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not a new phenomenon. If you look at U.S. political landscape, it has been very divided over the last uh, decades. Uh, so we have Republican media, Fox News, and others. We we have more democratic-leaning media, and uh, essentially one, one says white, the other says black. And that's the same with the Republican Party and Democratic Party, so very divided. A lot of these uh, issues that shouldn't be politicized are politicized. So is COVID real or is it not real? Should we essentially self-isolate and use masks or, or not? It's a political issue in the United States. Republicans disagree, Democrats agree. So, uh, And if you look at last uh, two decades, 
less and less uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress have been able to come together to a joint decision. So they, they essentially Republicans vote with the Republicans, Democrats with Democrats, and that's it. So this division is increasing uh, over the last uh, decades. What Trump did uh, now uh, over the uh, well, last uh, week, uh, so uh, he alienated a lot of Republicans because essentially he said uh, to his followers uh, indirectly, yes, but over uh, months and years, uh, this has been leading up to this, uh, he said that essentially we cannot trust the, the Congress, I should stay in power. This is something that, that not a democratic president says, this is what an authoritarian leader yeah. says, essentially I will stay in power regardless of elections. And well, his followers, for some reasons, very surprisingly for some Republicans, uh, took this seriously and went to the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress and tried to storm it. And uh, well, they said, execute Pence, uh, vice president, uh, who essentially disagreed with Donald Trump, and he's a Republican. Uh, so the U.S. US president had a uh, beef with uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Congress uh, Senate Manager George Leader, Mitch McConnell, also a Republican. So uh, Trump has alienated, uh, well, not all, but a lot of Republicans by his actions. Uh, so one thing is when only Democrats and Democratic media are uh, very, very critical of <laughs> Donald Trump. Another thing is when he loses even his uh, political party. And I'm saying his political party because Donald Trump has taken over Republicans quite effectively. If you look at the... Uh, the vote on uh, so whether we should confirm Biden as a uh, president. So there were 140 uh, around uh, Republicans in lower house, which uh, said, which voted again and again on a couple of uh, states that we shouldn't acknowledge the results uh, that uh, Biden won. And there is no basis uh, of any kind of claim that election has been stolen. This has been one of the most uh, kind of thoroughly evaluated and checked uh, election. Yes, uh, there were two cases in one state where a dead person voted, uh, but only two. So, so, so it's, it's not a, there's no reason for anyone to claim that uh, if, 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 if after all these, these, these um, kind, of, kind of evaluations and oversight, they found only extremely rare cases of election fraud, mm -hmm. um, there's no essentially basis for claiming that election has been stolen, that Trump is still a president. Uh, Trump, by saying this, he's essentially a dictator. He's a wannabe dictator in the United States. And that's a very, very, very big change. Uh, Donald Trump saying that Mexicans are rapists, uh, that the media are essentially fake news. That's one thing. Donald Trump trying to become a dictator, that's a whole new, uh, essentially, level of, uh, of uh, essentially Trump being a, a crazy political leader. I think there's interest, an interesting contradiction because from one side uh, we can see that the Republican Party has, well, classically in the last decades been anti-government, not anti-government, I would say, but small government, you know, mm. right? And we can see these authoritarian tendencies in, 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 for example, Trump's presidency. So what has been the reason why people voted for such an authoritarian figure in the first place? Yep, yep that's a very good question. Because uh, I've, I've actually looked into this uh, as well. So what I do in, uh, well, in my PhD, but also in my, my work, uh, one thing is I essentially research U.S. kind of foreign and also some domestic issues uh, so uh, to understand essentially what U.S. is doing in the world. Because if you know what U.S. is doing in the world, you can understand what's happening in a lot of regions cause, because of U.S. presence all across the world. And uh, before even Trump became U.S. president, during the election campaign, there was a uh, study done in the United States, uh, who votes for Donald Trump before he was before, before he was elected, and uh, out of various factors, you know, age, gender, uh, essentially education level, and so on, uh, the best one of the best predictors for support to Donald Trump was uh, whether the person is leaning towards authoritarianism. And uh, another thing that was very important in this survey uh, was uh, people uh, who uh, felt that uh, the world is uncertain and chaotic and, and dangerous. Uh, you know, the immigrants are coming, terrorists are coming, uh, there's chaos, uh, there's crime on the rise, and, and, and so on. These people are drawn to authoritarian tendencies, and so essentially if the terrorists are coming, we need someone to save us. Yeah. If the crime is on rise, we need someone to save us. And uh, this is what Donald Trump used in his election campaign. He has used this throughout his uh, presidency, internal enemies, external enemies. So internal enemies, crime is on the rise, African-Americans are protesting, external enemies, terrorists, immigrants, uh, NATO as well, for example, this external external organization stealing, uh, cheating United States. So he's tried to uh, paint the world in, uh, in, in as, as dark and, and, and kind of dangerous and problematic colors as possible to get um, actually Republicans afraid, to get Republicans want this macho authoritarian figure, Donald Trump, mm -hmm. 
uh, essentially to 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 kind of kind of paint the world as bad as possible to get more support from his uh, uh, essentially uh, supporters, the Republican Party. And um, well, if you do this for 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 decades and ages, uh, then then and then I'm just saying decades because a lot of things Trump has said about immigrants, about NATO, this is not new. In uh, 1989, Donald Trump said that NATO is cheating the United States, that Japan is cheating, U.S. coast allies mm -hmm. are cheating U.S. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, but now it's it's uh, it's been uh, essentially politicized quite effectively by, by Donald Trump, and he has uh, been able to uh, kind of stir up these authoritarian tendencies in the United States to mobilize political support for his uh, kind, of, kind of hateful, divisive uh, search of external and internal enemies. Um, it's a very, very cynical, very ruthless, but very effective political strategy strategy and this is nothing nothing unique a lot of leaders have used this uh, you know if you can find internal external enemy this is the say this is historical call easy way how to yeah. mobilize political support um. I agree it's just uh, very interesting that if we look at the situation what's going on in the United States it's rather interesting because um, you know previously uh, when Barack Obama and other people were in power uh, basically, people had um, this image in Europe and in other parts of uh, the world that the United States is the largest democracy and we should take example from them. And uh, when Donald Trump came into the play, it, it kind of shifted. And it's very interesting because I have always seen politics as kind of a theater. And others are just like actors, as we also call them uh, in politics. But it's very interesting about this authoritarian part. Um, because at some point I feel that psychologically people find Trump interesting. It's like you never can predict what is going to happen next because he's like a fighter uh, showing that I will fight against uh, the largest majority of the people. Maybe people kind of enjoy uh, this uh, theater because it's finally, uh, you know, challenging. It's interesting. It's tempting for mm -hmm. them. But is it something new also, my question would be? Well, definitely, there are, there are things that are new with Donald Trump, uh, essentially this information being spouted all the time, and, 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 and people simply believe it. Uh, if you look at uh, essentially decades ago, then if a politician says that, you know, that, I don't know, it's, it's raining outside when it's not raining, basically total nonsense, uh, then media calls it out. Yeah. At the moment, the biggest change is that uh, essentially uh, Republicans and Republican media defend Trump no matter what. So you can always spin. If Trump says something crazy, you can put a spin on it. He didn't mean it. You know, he was kind of exaggerating. Uh, he essentially uh, was kind of painting a picture with words. Uh, he didn't say that. And, and this is what's happening now. So there are Republicans who are saying that, uh, uh, you know, Trump didn't really uh, inspire the protest. Uh, he has done nothing wrong. And again, he did not say that, you know, go and storm the Capitol. But, but he said essentially almost, uh, almost the th same thing in his speech. And he's been saying that for, for essentially months and years. That elections have been stolen. We should do something about it and so on. But he never said, you know, you, my, my supporters, you go invade. You essentially, you, you call for death of vice president. You do all these things that you, which you did. Uh, so there is definitely this kind of, kind of plausible deniability. You know, he hasn't done, you know, anything. And even if he has done something, you know, as he called, uh, essentially kind of, kind of made uh, his um, attorney uh, call the Ukrainians to get some dirt on my political opponent, mm -hmm. even then you can try to spin. Essentially everything is, is a story. You can spin everything uh, this day and age. Uh, and if you have this environment of media and politicians, supporters of Trump, who are um, basically trying to spin everything he does, even the craziest things, in best possible light, then it's a big, big, big problem because uh, the poly not only Republicans and Democrats are divided, but also, uh, well, essentially voters. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of studies on this. Uh, the Republicans read one set of books, buy one set of books on Amazon, Democrats entirely different set of books. Uh, the same with uh, media, the, the essentially kind of influencers on social media, who they follow, totally different picture of the world. And if you have uh, essentially half of society living in, uh, in one reality, the other in a different reality, that's a big, big, big issue for your political system. Uh, even Joe Biden, when he's going to be confirmed president, uh, he's, it's very going to be very hard to kind of unify the, these, these, these big gaps and divisions because it's not just some uh, simple, uh, you know, kind, 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 of, kind of political issue. This is this whole value systems which have dri been driven more and more apart between the both uh, political parties. And if you look at Latvia, it's, it's not that, um, well, there's an analogy here. So we have uh, in Latvia roughly 20% of the population which uh, believes in what Russia says about mm -hmm. the world, that um, Krim Nash, uh, Putin is a great guy. And um, 
Well, we also have these deep divisions in our society that has existed for decades uh, and uh, that has definitely caused a lot of problems for kind of the domestic politics and the ability to include, for example, the Harmony Party and uh, essentially ruling coalition and so on. So uh, these divisions uh, are not, uh, not uh, that great for any country. And uh, what Trump has done over the last four years, he's, he's only increased these divisions up to the point when uh, there are essentially people storming Congress, up to the point where uh, within the Congress uh, there are extremely deep divisions. Uh, and and um, so, yeah, Trump hasn't made U.S. great. He's made U.S. more divided, more kind of kind of. Uh, chaotic, and uh, the political system is essentially in chaos uh, to, to some extent if you look at United States. So you wouldn't say that the two-party system is something to blame here because of Latvian analogies? Um, well, there are upsides and downsides to any political system. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, what is, uh, uh, there is, there is, there are very few things which are kind of, you know, these rules in political science, uh, which are kind of, well, not rules, but laws. Mm -hmm. But one uh, thing that is very close to law is that parliamentary systems are more stable than presidential systems. United States has been one of the few exceptions until Trump uh, with a stable presidential system. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at presidential systems, president has a lot of power. And usually, so Belarus, Russia, a lot of uh, southern Central American states France had, uh, as well. yeah, France. Uh, but France is a kind of mixed hybrid system. But essentially, if you look at Latin American countries, kind of a lot of former mm -hmm. Soviet states who, who are presidential, it's much easier for a president, one person, to concentrate power in his hands, uh, too much power, and try to take over, as it has happened a lot in uh, Latin America and also former Soviet uh, countries, uh, than in a parliamentary uh, system, where there are a couple of political parties. Yes, this, some, on some occasions also one political party can take over the system, definitely, but it is much harder if you have uh, three, five political parties who are fighting for yeah. consensus, one among another, is to kind of dominate the system. So in the U.S. Uh, was this uh, one rare uh, exception to this, uh, this kind of law, the presidential system systems are less stable, well, look at U.S. now, it confirms that uh, too much power in the uh, hands of one person who has basically immunity for many crime that he has done over the last four years uh, is not a great thing. And that's probably what's going to happen over the next four years. Uh, definitely, there's going to be a uh, evaluation of uh, both presidential powers on checks and balances in the United States. Uh, there's going to be attempt to, uh, well, not, not, not fix, but, but improve and, 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 and develop the system a bit more. So a leader like uh, Donald Trump, if someone like that is elected at some point in the future, cannot just do whatever he wants, break laws, uh, essentially incite essentially <laughs> uprising against the par par parliament and uh, so on. Um, when I take a look um, at Donald Trump's uh, four years of being uh, the president, uh, what have been his best achievements and his biggest failures? I think that he has managed to trigger uh, the society of Americans that they can't trust. Uh, like some part of people don't trust Democrats anymore, and Democrats there's and also the whole government because he's been talking about deep state and how the yes, government. Yes, and maybe need yeah. Them. What was it? One of his main aims of his term to make this uh, situation. Um, like this division of people is larger mm -hmm, in general. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm not going to talk about kind of his 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 his, <laughs> his kind of well, negative achievements because he's well, that's what he's talking all the time now. <laughs> Uh, I think that hasn't been kind of his aim to create these divisions, but this is simply his political strategy. If he wants to stay in power, if he wants to be a credible leader, he simply has to discredit all his opposition. He's making a lot of mistakes. He's essentially full of nonsense. The only way how you can sell nonsense is that you discredit all your critics. So media, they're fake news, they're lying. The government, they're deep state, they're going to get this conspiracy against the poor Trump. Uh, uh, so if you can create this worldview where you are the good guy, you know the truth, you're fighting against this evil, and all your critics, they're evil, they are under a conspiracy from the deep state, there is kind of media conspiracy against Trump, and so on. If you can create this worldview when the opposition, they're evil, they're bad, I'm the good guy, they're not opposition, they're, they're essentially kind of, kind of these evil doers who are trying to bring down the United States and Trump and so on. That is the only political strategy you can have if you are spouting nonsense all the time, because Trump is essentially, essentially lying most of the time in his speeches and his announcements and he's making a lot of mistakes. The only way how you can uh, be a president like that is by demonizing the opposition and saying that you are, well, I'm Donald Trump, I'm defending against these evil doers in the liberal media and in kind of deep state and, and uh, from NATO as well and so on. Uh, that, that, that's, um, that's more of not a, so the divisions, it's not a, not a kind of, kind of, 
his goal, this is this is byproduct of his political strategy, uh, how he got elected and how he is ruling the country. Uh, and in that sense, this is a very, very ruthless, very cynical, very, very horrible, but a very pragmatic and very smart strategy that he's been using. So if you look at Republicans over the last four years, uh, 40 percent of U.S. population, uh, almost all the Republicans, have been supportive of Donald Trump no matter what he says. Uh, he has effectively taken over the Republican Party, Republican uh, congressmen uh, who criticized uh, him uh, during his election campaign. Almost uh, well, all of them, most of them are pro-Trump in his camp at the moment. Uh, he has definitely t- taken the central role in the um, Republican Party and in U.S. politics. Um, and so we're going to see with the um, uh, so what the Senate is going to vote on impeachment, if uh, Senate uh, votes that, yes, we should kick Trump out of the office, uh, that might be uh, kind of kind of this. this. So, so if the Senate, a couple of Senate senior leaders, Mitch McConnell and others, if they think that this is a way how you can kind of throw out Trump off Republican Party and off uh, out of kind of politics in the next foreseeable future, they might even vote for, uh, Senate might even vote for kicking out Trump out of the office uh, because he won't be able to. Uh, if they if they essentially uh, take a clause in this this impeachment, they even will not be able uh, to assume any more federal offices. He won't be able to run if Republicans decide they want to actually get rid of Donald Trump in the Republican Party. Uh, they have a chance to do of doing this now. If they don't do it, um, then our Trump is going to still play a big role in the Republican Party over next years. Uh, so he has uh, well effectively taken over uh, this political party. Uh, essentially, he's created a personality cult. Uh, and all these things that I'm saying, these are achievements for Donald Trump. These are horrible for democracy, horrible for the United States, and also horrible for the for rest of the world. If a populist, if a uh, um, actually person who's lying all the time, who's critical of NATO, uh, supportive of Russia and other authoritarian states, uh, if he is playing and will be playing a big role in the Republican Party, unless he is impeached by the uh, Senate, um, uh, he's still going to keep a major role in the United States. Even if he is thrown out of the office, uh, he's still going to play a big role. Um, so, because simply he has a lot of followers. He has Fox News, uh, which has over last month become more distance from Trump, but still, still, uh, there is a lot of support within uh, Republican media and also society towards uh, his ideas, uh, his statements, uh, his uh, personality, his, uh, his uh, well, kind of craziness, uh, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, but if we look at this um, U.S. perspective or the international society's perspective, what are the main positive achievements? What he has done, you know, not looking perhaps on his personality, but uh, you know, as a very, I don't know, just a president. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I, th- there are some who would disagree with with me on this, but. Uh, my perspective is that there are very, very few. If you look at what he has done in the international arena, he's done more harm than uh, good. Uh, they're, 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 I know, for example, even even kind of his achievements, well, achievements of his administration, uh, in a lot of cases where there has been a diplomatic process going on, uh, I don't know, the, the trade war with Europe or with China, for example, uh, Trump's tweets on multiple occasions derailed the whole negotiation process where his diplomats are on the on the ground they've been talking for months about well how we can fix this what the US wants what what Europe wants what China wants and so on and then Trump just tweets something that's totally removed from what's happening in the discussion processes and derails derails the whole negotiation process uh, and it makes it extremely hard for US diplomats to get you know the good deal Trump has promised uh, if he simply doesn't really um, well, essentially, listen to his his what, what's happening in this negotiation room. He just tweets whatever he wants. Uh, the same thing with with foreign policy. Uh, on many occasions, uh, Trump simply has poured more oil into the fire with his tweets, uh, with his changing his decisions. Um, I know his kind of big achievements. Uh, he went and talked with Kim uh, Jong Un, uh, with, with the North Korean leader, initially. So he kind of got this deal where they're going to stop and uh, kind of kind of continuing their nuclear program. Yeah, on paper, it's a deal. In reality, nothing has really changed. You know, North Korea is working on its missile missile, missile program, on its nuclear program. So, you know, Trump got this, this win on paper. He, he was very loud about it. You know, we've, I've done it. It's amazing. You know, Barack yeah. Obama never did anything. But if you have a deal on paper, it doesn't mean it's 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 actually happening in the real world. Uh, there, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, so, you know, you can put on paper anything. 
if you don't have mechanisms how to check it, if you don't have mechanisms how to enforce it, and, and Trump and the treaty with, with North Korea didn't have any of this, um, nothing really changes. So there, there, is, there are a lot of these things. For example, another thing, some people in Latvia also believe this, uh, that uh, Trump made NATO countries spend more. That's yeah, a myth. I, I, think, I think this is uh, something that came to my mind, but as I understand, that's a myth. Yeah, that's, a, that's a myth. That's a risk. <laughs> Uh, that's another thing. Uh, so Trump inherited a very good economy from Barack mm -hmm. Obama. Trump yes. inherited also uh, essentially the, the, the pledge in NATO summit in 2014, 2016, before Trump. NATO countries already yeah. had pledged to essentially Barack Obama administration that they will increase their defense budgets to up to 2%, and they had essentially set a timeline. So for, for Baltic State, it was, uh, I think, 2018. Uh, for Germany, 2022. For other countries, uh, essentially other kind of timelines when they're going to reach this 2% goal. And they started increasing budgets already in 2014, in some cases, or 2016, after the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So it wasn't Trump which made the countries increase their defense budget. It was Barack Obama. And then Trump, by all this rhetoric, uh, Kind of, kind of created this illusion that he hijacked. made, uh, yeah, essentially hijacked. That, that's, that's one thing. Another thing is um, that um, um, I'm not even sure if, if there have been any cases where a country has increased the defense budget, maybe Poland, but I'm not sure about this. But, but for most countries, it is very hard to increase, especially for, for major European great powers, it is hard to increase the defense budget now because, you know, Macron or Merkel, they're going to look weak if under Trump's bullying, they agreed that, well, yes, I need to cave in and I'm going to increase my budget because Trump ordered me to do so. It's become even harder for European leaders to increase defense budgets mm -hmm. because it's going to look essentially, you know, you're, you're in charge of this uh, great... history. Well, you're essentially weak. You're a weak yeah. leader. You're listening to this bully, and you're essentially say it, doing what he tells you to do. So there might even be this, this, this kind of backlash by, by Trump ordering European allies around, do this, do that. Um, of course, if you are a leader of a great European nation, you just can't cave in in these kind of, kind of bullying uh, remarks by, by Donald Trump. Uh, so, so there might be even the opposite effect, uh, that, 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 that the leaders are not inclined to uh, increase the defense uh, budget just because Trump orders them to do so not going through. And this is overall the kind of, kind of Trump's, Trump's kind of foreign policy approach and also domestic <laughs> policy approach, uh, giving these commands, orders uh, in domestic politics. Trump has been using much more of these executive orders uh, than any president before him, mm -hmm. simply writing the, these kind of presidential directives, uh, well, do this. Because uh, uh, this is his, his style, you know, as, as a dictator, as a king, well, do this, follow me. And there's no diplomatic process, no even kind of domestic consultation process uh, that's going on in the United States uh, because U.S. president simply does not kind of believe in it or, or, or think that's how, how a uh, domestic or foreign policy should be conducted. And probably that's what he's used to by being in charge of a big company because there he's paying everyone. If the people are not doing what he says, he can simply fire them. He can't fire Merkel. He can't fire Macron. Uh, you know, with, with closest allies, you just can't order them around. And, and for some reason, there's a backlash against U.S. foreign policy across uh, most of the world. And again, f for other countries and regions, for Israel, definitely Trump has been very beneficial for Saudi Arabia. Uh, so Barack Obama tried to distance the uh, United States from kind of... Uh, Saudi Arabia and then uh, Israel, he tried to essentially kind of become more, you know, hands off this balance of power approach in the region. Uh, Trump well went all in. We are going to support Saudi Arabia and, and, and Israel, and, and who cares about Iran? We need to punish them. So mm -hmm. definitely, for some countries, definitely Trump has been very, very a, um, a good uh, president. Uh, but but if you look at uh, kind of Baltic perspective and, and European perspective. Uh, for example, the defense budget has been increased, uh, the NATO presence here has been increased, not because of Trump. Uh, U.S. Congress uh, assigns defense budget for uh, NATO for this region. If the Congress votes, um, well, spend more, uh, then U.S. military is going to spend more. Trump has nothing to do with the fact that there is more stuff and, and happening in, in, in the kind of defense area and in Baltics and in Poland. Um, yeah, and just to add another thing on this, uh, U.S. Congress in 2016, when, US, uh, when Trump became U.S. president, U.S. C Congress passed a law that Donald Trump is not allowed to ease sanctions on Russia. So U.S. Congress felt in 2016, after Trump became president, yeah. that they need to constrain Trump's foreign policy-making powers because we cannot trust him with Russia. So, uh, well, I, as, as I said, I'm very, very cynical and critical about any Trump's accomplishments mm -hmm. uh, because for most of the, the part, he's been essentially pouring oil in the flames. Uh, and, and if something good has happened, uh, it's very, very highly 
doubtful that, that, that Trump uh, has been uh, the author of these good changes. And even on multiple occasions, like with NATO, also in Middle Eastern, uh, so there was this, this treaty between Israel and Jordan and a couple other countries, uh, and then U.S. jumps on it. Trump jumps on it. Hey, I did this. I did it. I, I made this. Not really. So there's this local domestic process, uh, which Trump administration tried to kind of kind of take and sell us theirs. And on multiple occasions, uh, that's what Trump has tried to do, say that, well, I've done this, whatever this is, uh, or kind of oversell achievements. Uh, this, this trade war with the U.S. had with Europe, it ended essentially with nothing. Uh, the trade, the, the sanctions U.S. imposed, Europe imposed is still in place. They agreed that Europe is going to buy more soybeans or something meaningless like that. And then Trump sell this as a big win. I won this trade war with Europe, and so they're going to buy more soybeans. It, it's not, you know. <laughs> so yeah, very often, so there, there is big, big difference between what Trump says and what's actually happening on, on the ground. And, and for a lot of people, if Trump says this again and again and again, and media repeats it, 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 it well, of course, it, it makes sense. It's US president, you know. Well, usually when US president says something, it, it's credible. Uh, but this is a big, also, and if you study political science and international relations, it's, it's not only with Trump, but on a lot of occasions, so the words are very different than, 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 than deeds, than what's actually happening on the ground. And it is hard, it takes time, you have to kind of, kind of read and then follow the events uh, to see the, the, the big, 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 big picture. It's not just with Trump, it's, um, it's a very big problem in how you are analysis that uh, you can say one thing and reality can be very, very different. Yeah, it's just fascinating how he is good at, like, good nonsense seller, and people uh, trust uh, him. A yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a businessman. Uh, <laughs> he's good at what he does. Um, but uh, going further, is there something Trump still can do in order to stay at office, like a plot twist that no one expected him to do, or maybe expected uh, to do, and that's why the second impeachment came. Well, not not not, not anymore. Uh, so uh, one thing is that Trump has uh, lost uh, so the support of Vice President and of uh, Congress, uh, the, the the Senate major Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So these two key players who theoretically could have done something. So. Um, in which Trump asked both of them repeatedly to do something to essentially steal the election. Trump was trying to steal the election. He was saying that the Democrats or whatever, deep state, whatever is, or, or QAnon and crazy conspiracies are stealing the election. Now, Trump is the one who is trying to hijack the election, stay in power illegally as an authoritarian dictator. Uh, and uh, so the key players who could have done something um, have either essentially, well, not done something uh, or, or, or even resigned from the office as a couple of uh, the... Um, Mm -hmm. uh, members of U.S. Uh, Trump's cabinet have, uh, and at the moment, after the the, the, the revolt next to the Congress, uh, so basically, so so there is uh, there is definitely still support within Republican Party uh, of Donald Trump, but uh, if you look at the statements of a lot of people in Senate, uh, for example, if there was a vote uh, in the Senate, we're going to see next week uh, on whether to kind of confirm impeachment. At the moment, roughly 20 U.S. Uh, senators are kind of kind of considering of throwing Trump out of the office, uh, and this is much more than previously in previous impeachment where the Republicans were united pro-Trump bloc, uh, so there isn't. And again, looking even at Fox News, uh, even Fox News uh, has become over the last month increasingly more critical of Donald Trump uh, because even the Fox News, they are essentially uh, kind of, they're not pro-authoritarianism, they are pro-democracy. They well, Trump. Won the uh, lost the election, he had his chance to kind of explore legal options and try to find voter fraud. He couldn't find any evidence, so the Fox News concluded that that well he lost. I found it personally interesting. Maybe others don't, but that he uh, cho chose this after he was thrown out of uh, social media. Uh, he uh, chose this approach. Maybe it was a strategy or tactic that he uh, took a silent treatment and disappeared for approximately a week. And then he came and gave a speech on how much he has done uh, with this Mexican wall, uh, how large the importance is of it. Why? Well, <laughs> it's very simple. When, whenever Trump does something crazy, uh, he has two strategies. One is he's trying to spin it. You know, this I didn't mean it. This was something else, or 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 kind of kind of you know. Actually, I meant this. That's one thing. You put a spin on it that you actually are the good guy. The other thing is you distract. You uh, well either do something even more crazy than the media focuses on the next thing, or you're trying, in, as in this case, talk about your achievements. You know, like, why are media talking about this? It's nonsense. Look at the real problem. 
And uh, very often over the last four years, media bought it. So Trump does something crazy, says something loud. If they forget the previous scandal, they move to the next scandal. Uh, and they simply don't have the time to explore the previous issue. And, you know, kind of, because Trump has done a lot of, if, if Bill Clinton or any president before had done, I don't know, like, I don't know what percent of things Trump has done or said over the last four years, uh, he would have had a lot of, a lot of trouble. But for Trump, this is essentially style, crisis to crisis, diversion to diversion. And, um, that, but that, that, that's one part of it. The other part of it is uh, this: the fact that U.S. president has basically abdicated from his power. He hasn't done, as you said, anything for for a week. Um, this shows uh, how essentially weak Donald Trump is. He's lost his support. He cannot really. He's trying to, but he cannot really spin this uh, anymore. Uh, what he did, essentially, his words, his actions, led to a mob attacking U.S. Uh, Congress. Uh, essentially, led to death of uh, four or five uh, people. Uh, uh, that's pretty, pretty damning. Uh, some Republicans are trying to spin it, yes, but but um, I don't think Trump can get out of uh, this one easily uh, or or at all because this isn't. Uh, so basically, this is, this is the next step over simply you know lying, being crazy, throwing out nonsense. These are real actions. Uh, this is. Uh, and there are a lot of things uh, that, 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 that makes it so. You know, the, the uh, Confederate flag in the Congress had never entered Congress even during the Civil War. Now, because of Trump, this kind of separate, this, 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 this actually kind of Civil War symbol uh, entered U.S. Uh, Congress. Uh, actually, people uh, storming Congress not happened since uh, 19, uh, 1812 uh, when British soldiers entered uh, Congress. So that's... that's uh, Pretty, pretty damning and pretty harsh. It's very hard to spin. Uh, well, I didn't do it. You know, actually, this was a good thing, uh, or, or whatever Trump is trying to, to say that he this wasn't his fault. Um, so, so that's kind of next level thing that's very hard for. Um, so basically, if you're trying to become an, a dictator, if you're trying to to kind of storm Congress. Uh, uh, that's a no-no. So you can call Mexicans rapists. You can essentially kind of, kind of, kind of make fun of this people, the people with disability. You can pick fights with closest allies. You can do all crazy stuff. If you're trying to become a dictator, that that's a line you can't really cross in U.S. So U.S. Uh, thankfully is not going to become a uh, authoritarian uh, regime, which the Trump was definitely trying to do over last uh, month. And this is crazy that I'm saying this. Uh, so this is United States, you know, the symbol of democracy and so on. Uh, U.S. with Trump as president has become a uh, essentially source of disinformation in Latvia and elsewhere. For example, disinformation about uh, COVID, uh, which Trump has been lying about constantly. Uh, the U.S. has essentially eroded its uh, soft power, its ability to inspire, its ability to achieve uh, things in uh, well, foreign policy. And, and there are a lot of examples about this. Uh, for example, in Latvia and also other countries, uh, unless, well, the U.S. Embassy was kind of kind of happy here that there's COVID, they don't have to make an election event because they were afraid, you know, what's going to happen, what Trump's going to say, you know, because previously it's a big party, you know, this, this, this event of U.S. soft power, you know, they invited all the, all the kind of local political and kind of business, whatever leaders. Now they're happy that they don't have to make this event because, you know, they don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and a lot of these, these, these uh, other uh, ways, for example, the number of students who are going to study in the U.S. before COVID had gone down very sharply. Uh, because students don't feel safe because they are not, you know, especially non-white students don't feel safe going to the United States because of Trump, because of Republicans. So, uh, yeah, U.S. soft power, this ability to inspire, to, to kind, of, kind of show this image in other countries and people want to be like Americans. Yeah, with Trump as president, that's totally destroyed uh, and Biden is going to have a very hard time. And overall, U.S. diplomats and politicians are going to have a very hard time uh, talking about, you know, U.S. values and, you know, this American ideals and so on, because American ideals, well, Trump is American ideals because a lot of Americans support Donald Trump. Uh, you know, bigotry, homophobia, lies, disinformation, these are American values now. And, 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 and this is not a kind of, kind of crazy statement. A lot of diplomats, you know, diplomats, traditional diplomats would be upset about me saying this. But this is what America is now. And you can't just whitewash it with, you know, diplomacy and these, these nice language, you know, American values are great and democracy mm -hmm. and so on, because it's simply not true anymore. Uh, Trump's Republican Party is the same Republican Party uh, during Abraham Lincoln's, Lincoln's time. The policies have changed completely, right? So... Uh, Beforehand, the Republican Party was the party of the North, the party of the free states, in a sense, the, the states that didn't have the slavery. And uh, at the same time, the Democrats were at the time the Confederate, uh, in a sense, uh, supporting uh, party uh, where they were for slavery, pro-slavery. So how do policies change? Why has it been, uh, a, well, 
specifically perhaps uh, in America, that these parties in a way have switched their positions and and perhaps you can comment on yeah, this. Yeah. Um, so uh, in, in a multi-party system, so usually where uh, when, when I don't know, the world changes, the politics changes, the agenda changes. Uh, very often there is a uh, new party, which, um, I don't know, with green values, for example, over the last decades, a lot of green parties have popped up in Europe, um, so defending these values. So you have a new political player enter the arena, and well, the new, power, new, new party gets votes, uh, maybe even gets in the coalition, and basically what kind of changes direction of uh, politics. In US, so two-party system, so, uh, but within these two parties, within Republicans, within Democrats, there are various groups in Congress. There are so these so-called caucuses, groups of uh, essentially congressmen who are I know, supporting, for the Baltic caucus, for example, groups, uh, a group of uh, Repub uh, both Republicans and Democrats who are sympathetic to Baltic interests, uh, but also on various other issues, on economy, on, on, on the kind of, kind of, kind of domestic uh, issues, even on, on race gender, whatever, there are different groups within uh, both parties which uh, think that, you know, this issue is more important than that issue. And uh, so in these groups within the political party, within the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, they fight for the power. And as the time moves on, within uh, years and decades, uh, so one group becomes more powerful within that party and kind of the agenda of the political party changes. And this is what happened with Donald Trump as well and with Republicans now. Over the last, uh, well, even before Trump, so so this is essentially so eight, even 12 years uh, ago, so Republican Party started to change. So we had the um, Sarah Palin as the uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, and she was kind of this, this proto-Trump, essentially a politician who is uh, spouting nonsense and lying uh, all the time, but she Who's has... Alaska. Alaska, yes, and she was a vice presidential candidate for mm -hmm. McCain when he was running for a U.S. presidential uh, post. Uh, and she was essentially very similar to Trump. She didn't know much about U.S. domestic policy or foreign policy. She was lying, uh, she was making mistakes, but she was speaking very passionately. And she had huge crowds, she had uh, quite a big influence during mm -hmm. the, the election campaign. And uh, after her, the Tea Party uh, appeared in the United States, these kind of very, very kind of, kind of, libertarian and, you know, let's have a small state. And again, and also a lot of crazy ideas in this movement. And the party got uh, a couple of uh, U.S. congressmen elected with these crazy beliefs. And now we have Trump with essentially his, his supporters uh, getting elected. And also we have a couple of now QN and basically kind of conspiracy supporter congressmen. So within time, so the, the, the members of the uh, Republican Party, the uh, members uh, in, in the Congress of the Republican Party, they change. And with that, the agenda of the party changes as well. And that's, that's, that's totally normal. That's how U.S. political system works. Uh, so in Europe, so we usually have a new political party form around a new issue. In the uh, U.S., we have a new group within the Republicans or, or, or Democrats uh, form. Uh, in the case of Trump and this kind of populist movement, um, not the best change in, Dem in, in the Republican Party. Um, but in Democrats, it's the same. In the Democratic Party, we now have uh, a more kind of social democratic wing, which has become stronger and stronger within the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders and a couple of other politicians um, who are transforming the Democratic Party towards uh, more uh, social uh, democratic uh, kind of take on politics. And that's, that's, that's normal. That's how U.S. political system works. So that's how two-party system works. Um, and um, definitely, yes, the Republican Party now is nothing like the Republican Party well, even 10 years ago. We don't have to compare sure. with, with uh, hundreds of years ago. Sure. I know that this is one of, uh, just one of many events, but uh, yesterday, I think the, the 13th of January, uh, one, of, one of the ladies who worked in, as I think in, in, the, in the election uh, counting uh, vote process, and she was arrested because of election fraud, uh, illegal voting, and I know that uh, during, uh, you know, the time when the election votes were counted, it was one of the Trump's, uh, I think, allegations that, he, you know, the, he, that these, uh, these elections are like fraud. How does it look like? Uh, was it staged, uh, this, uh, this thing with this lady, as like a proof to the people that actually there was a fraud uh, and it is true what he's saying? Or... How, how do you see yeah, well, it? You can't comment on this specific case uh, because it just happened. So we're going to see within the next uh, week. So what's the big picture? But overall, if you look at all his allegations, uh, so, you know, 
voting machines were rigged. You know, there there there's mass kind of kind of ma- masses of dead people voting, or or or, 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 or essentially I don't know, kind of kind of, or, or or fraud in counting the votes, and and, and there is simply no proof to that. Uh, so both in Georgia and in Pennsylvania and elsewhere in Wisconsin, they recounted the votes, they looked at these allegations. Uh, in some cases, simply there was nothing. You know, someone thought there, you know, I think there was you know, voter fraud, but there's no evidence uh, when the evidence was given. So basically nothing was found or extreme rare cases. Uh, so basically Trump lost by tens of thousands of votes in these states. It's not just, you know, a hundred or, or a small number. Uh, even if there were 0.0001 point of uh, cases where there was some problem, you know, as I said, two, I think it was, it was, I think it was in Georgia where two dead people voted. Uh, so basically, someone received in the mail the 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 envelope for the vote, and the partner or, or relative died, and and then basically the person is dead, and then, and then a relative fills out the form. So and one of them voted for Trump, by the way. Uh, so yeah, so uh, it's it's not it's not a mass large scale fraud, you know, tens of thousands. Um, yeah. So there's no even if there were some extremely rare isolated cases where something went wrong, and that's normal, you know, it's it's a mass election, you know hundreds of millions uh, of yeah. people are voting. It's definitely there's going to be mistakes and some problems, but uh, nothing substantial, uh, nothing um, nothing you can go to court with, and which yeah. is what Trump did. He went to court, and courts found nothing. There is essentially no proof of any uh, significant uh, tampering with the uh, elections in the United States. Um, so uh, and that's, uh, and again, there's no proof. Still, Trump says the election was hijacked. Uh, still, there are Republicans who agree with this, basically this information, these lies uh, coming from US president. So in Latvia, we've talked about this information coming from Russia. As I said, so this information, lies are coming from US president, and they play a big role in, um, well, you know, for example, in COVID, uh, fighting against COVID disinformation. If Russia says lies, it reaches, actually, yes, it reaches some people in Latvia. If U.S. president says lies about COVID, you know, drink bleach, uh, essentially, or don't wear masks, yeah. it reaches a much, much wider audience than uh, simply when Putin or Russian media says something uh, crazy like that. So basically, he is good at seeding doubt because of the position he is, like the authority of... Uh, well, that's that's definitely yeah. one, yes, authority of the office, definitely. Um, and this is also the case in Latvia, for example. Mm-hmm. Well, in Latvia, we had the, uh, uh, this was when the Rosnach was the Minister of uh, Justice. Uh, so the Ministry of Justice, they came out with essentially a conspiracy uh, theory uh, that uh, the Istanbul Convention, it's about, you know, more genders and so on. This is an, 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 an basically what the Ministry of Justice put out in Latvia, a ideologically loaded conspiracy theory about this, this Istanbul Convention. And that's very strong if the Ministry of Justice says this, even if it's a conspiracy theory, which makes no sense, you know, there's going to be this kind of, so the 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 the, or the, the international organizations uh, which are run by feminists are going to kind of kind of kind of dictate the laws of Latvia, and in reality, this 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 uh, convention against violence in families, it's about introducing more than one gender, uh, more than two genders, and so on, total nonsense. But if the Ministry of Justice says this, it gives it credibility because you know. You know, most people assume that there are smart people working in Ministry of Justice, not conspiracy theorists. Uh, but it's not always the case. Uh, this, this, this kind of—if you have an office, it gives you clout of credibility. It gives you clout of, uh, of uh, kind of seriousness. Uh, but again, it's not always the case that uh, uh, very often there's politicized information coming out from ministries or for political leaders. Uh, very often there is also this information in Latvia. So in Latvia. Uh, we've had also, and then this is this is some Trump. Trump is not that unique. In U.S., there have been conspiracies going on around in Latvian mainstream politics. There are conspiracies going around for decades. So George Soros, mm-hmm. that's yeah. a conspiracy theory. It's nonsense. But uh, Greens and farmers, and also some others, have been using it for decades in Latvia. Uh, about immigration, a lot of conspiracies. You know, they're going to come take over, and we're going to live in Islamic caliphate. Uh, uh, this was, I think, two, three years ago. So in Latvia, Latvia didn't uh, sign uh, to the uh, United Nations uh, this, this migration convention because of conspiracies. Uh, National Alliance, uh, New Conservative Party, a couple of others uh, voted against this UN convention because of conspiracies. They claim that this, is, this treaty is going to open borders, flood Latvia with immigrants, and so on. That's a conspiracy. Basically, you're saying that UN is evil. It's trying to kind of destroy Latvia as we know it and so on. Most of the world passed it. Estonia passed it. Nothing happened. Latvia said no because of conspiracies. So, so kind of conspiracies, it's not that, that... So I'm not that surprised that at the moment in Latvia and in US, um, so a lot of people have fallen for conspiracy theories because conspiracies and these, this kind of crazy nonsense, it has been part of daily domestic politics in Latvia and US for a long, long time. Now we have more crazy conspiracies <laughs> with... with, with 
a couple of local uh, crazies and crazy on Trump in US. Uh, but still, if you look at the United States, uh, after a war in Iraq, uh, I remember it's like half of Republicans believe that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11. He wasn't nothing to do with 9-11, but again, to sell this war, so this image that Saddam Hussein kind of supported terrorists and, and so on was created to sell war in Iraq. Uh, so it's, 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 um, there's a lot of, lot of um, to basically Trump and also local populists and conspiracy theorists, uh, they didn't just magically appear. Uh, there are a lot of, lot of problems, a lot of uh, well, disinformation and, and, and manipulation and attempts going around in, in Latvian politics, but also in the United States. It's nothing that... Um, well, Trump and local populists and conspiracy nuts. It's not a, I'm not that surprised that, that uh, it's happening now, what's happening with COVID disinformation, because there are all these, these things existed before, now they've been amplified by, as I said, so Trump used this uncertainty and chaos to have these, to, to promote these authoritarian tendencies. And this is what happens in any crisis. People want stability, want these simple answers, want a macho leader who's gonna kind of take care of them, even if he can't, but he's projecting this image of stability, yeah. simple answers. Uh, yeah. I just want to say that uh, actually SARS conspiracies are very, very famous. To, like, I don't know if only recently, but I think in for like two decades around, because especially when it comes to education, that's funny, because um, one of the fa most famous th theories is that um, SARS gives uh, scholarships to people uh, and, uh, and then he's like a godfather and these people like tried with his work their works to pay him back uh, like working uh, in his favor it's just it's just interesting yeah yeah but it, 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 again it makes very little sense so yes definitely in 90s uh, George Soros Open Society Foundation uh, gave money to Eastern Europe but uh, they all gave money also to the uh, uh, NGOs uh, connected with I don't know like choirs or dancing collectives and so on because no one else was giving any funding there uh, our president uh, Gil Slevitz he was a you know Sorosite uh, but but uh, he's uh, so with the conservatives like him so they never talk that he essentially was, you know, a Soros. <laughs> it's, 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 it's this attempt to discredit the opposition that they don't like. You know, it's, it's basically, it's, it's like, like calling someone stupid or evil. It's a swear word they're throwing around that creates this emotional reaction, you know, this, this external evil. The same with what Trump is doing, you know, these, these external enemies, uh, these Soros external, Sorosites internal enemy. So you're just simply trying to discredit your opposition by saying that they are working for this evil there's a kind of conspiracy uh, theory uh, that, that has been floating around in Latvia for, for uh, essentially two decades uh, now. And uh, I, I can't comment more on this, but, but there have been researchers in Latvia who've, who've looked at this, that initially it didn't exist, and then at one point someone came up with it, and then it spread. So uh, it's, it's, it's a, um, and then and there are a lot of these, these, for example, again, about this myth of rise of fascism. Uh, so that March uh, 16th, this Legionnaire, Legionnaire's Remembrance Day, mm -hmm. so up to, I think, 1998, Russia didn't care about it. So it was happening, no talk about fashion, on the rise, and so on. Then I think it was 1998, Russia decides to politicize this, and Russia starts talking about this day is the day when the fascist is, fascists are marching in Latvia, it's horrible, and so on. So basically politicizing the, the, these, um, well, basically, well, non-issue, <laughs> That's, that wasn't a big deal before. And that's uh, also what happens. Uh, so if you look at uh, Trump, uh, if you look at Russia, if you look at these kind of values. So uh, for, for example, in Russia, uh, these conservative values, they were not politicized early on um, until Putin did it. In the early 2000s, I don't know if you, you remember, there was a big band in Russia, Tattoo. These two lesbian girls, uh, they represented yes. Russia in Eurovision, and Russia, nobody cared about it, you know, gay, you know, kind of all these, you know, the, yeah. on the stage in front of kids, and that, that, that was not an issue. And then Russian government decided to politicize these conservative values, and now Russia has become this beacon of conservative values. The same in Latvia and the United States, uh, essentially, kind of, kind of, people have noticed that they can use uh, specific values to get people kind of rail up against changes, uh, rail up against kind of this, this kind of modernity. They can get votes for this. And um, so that's what they're doing. They're trying to create these, in my opinion, non-issues. You know, the Christmas is being stolen in, in, in the United States or in, in Latvia, you know, kind of, kind of the traditional family is being under attack. Uh, yeah, you can use these, these emotional sounding issues uh, to, to get political support. Um, and that's another thing that I... Um, so we had talked about Trump. Oh, he's uh, kind of, kind of... Um, thinking about these political calculations, so I can use these authoritarian sentiments or, or, or this, this, this image of chaos around to get votes. 
And uh, this is a very important thing that kind of political logic is very, very different from kind of you know, everyday logic or the formal logic. Political logic is uh, basically how I can get re-elected. I want to stay in power. If you're a politician, that's what you want to do. And that's your primary kind of goal is to be re-elected. And this changes how, how basically you perceive the world and then kind of, kind of, kind of your, your agenda. Uh, if you want your, your primary goal is to be elected, so you look at your uh, constituents, your electorate. So what is, what is going to get me elected? And uh, for Democrats, they can't do these things that Trump has done. For Trump, if the surveys show that these authoritarian tendencies might work, uh, yeah, why not? Why not use it? If you are a very cynical, very ruthless uh, political candidate, um, there are no rules. You can do whatever you want if it, can, if it is going to get you re-elected. Well, we can see that Trump's strategy uh, hasn't worked. Uh, so Trump's, uh, and why I'm saying it hasn't worked, that, uh, well, Trump lost the election in uh, 2016, the popular vote. Yes, he was elected, but he didn't get the majority of votes. Now, in 2018, Republicans lost the lower house with Trump as the president. Now, <laughs> Republicans, well, in 2020, Trump was impeached. Trump lost the election in 2020. Now, in 2021, uh, the Republicans lost the Senate, and Trump is impeached again. So Trump's strategy, although very polarizing, very, very kind of, kind of crazy, very sensationalist, has not worked. Republicans have lost with Trump as a president. Uh, yes, society is divided. US is essentially a very chaotic pol political situation, very problematic kind of foreign policy, but uh, Trump's strategy has been a disaster. If you look at uh, Republican Party, if you look at his achievements uh, in the office, so Republicans who controlled the presidency, both houses control nothing now. In uh, Well, the, uh, not nothing, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm exaggerating, but, uh, but uh, so yeah, there's definitely been, uh, so the strategy hasn't um, delivered uh, what, what um, well, what is the, the goal of any party or politician stay in power. So let's now uh, go beyond Trump and let's step into the shoes of NATO. What are the main geopolitical concerns, challenges that NATO faces in the next four to eight years? Perhaps, uh, a longer time frame, if if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and again, I, I'm going to tie this with Biden administration, because um, because this is my uh, kind of hope. Uh, so I became uh, so this is this this was my my my, my kind of my strategy. So when I was studying, I studied in the United States uh, twice, uh, and my my kind of goal was uh, that I can kind of sell this this the kind of expertise on US we in in, in Latvia. Oh, well. Okay, okay. But yeah, that that, that that was my kind of kind of goal and and and, and I, don't know, I don't know agenda how I can kind yeah. of sell myself uh, in kind of Latvia Latvian kind of, I don't know, kind of media or kind of domestic kind of political analyst mm -hmm. circles. And uh, with Donald Trump as a president, uh, so I was commenting on 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 what's happening in US. But very often I was asked, you know, to comment kind of this Trump's crazy stuff. You know, he, he said something crazy, so what does it mean? Or, or again and again this year I was asked, is there going to be civil war in the U.S. And, and so on. And that's kind of, kind of it's, it's good for media, you know, it's, it's kind of sensationalist and so on. Yeah. And now I'm very happy that uh, with Joe Biden as a president I can talk about, you know, like, what, what's Real the U.S.? Real issues. Yeah, yeah, you know, what U.S. foreign policy towards NATO and what NATO agenda is going to be over the next years? How is it going to change with yeah, Biden? Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. these substantial issues, not just, you know, Trump said something crazy, so what does it mean? Is he gonna, I don't know, abandon NATO, or, or, or you know, is he gonna invade Iran, Iran or, or, or whatever? Sure. Um, so I'm very glad to talk about this <laughs> and talking about uh, NATO, NATO next, uh, next, next four years and Joe Biden. So one thing that uh, is definitely gonna change. Uh, so uh, basically, Joe Biden has uh, said repeatedly. Basically, he looks at uh, Russia very similar to how Baltic states see Russia. During uh, Obama's presidency, uh, Joe Biden, his vice president, he was in, uh, well, kind of, well, yeah, you could say in charge of this kind of Russia uh, direction of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Biden went to Latvia, to Moscow and elsewhere, gave speeches. He gave speech in, in uh, the, the, the National Library uh, mm -hmm. on Russian reset, one of the kind of the key speeches. So he tried reset, then he understood this doesn't work. Uh, he gave more critical speeches towards Russia. So he knows uh, basically how Russia works, how Putin works. Um, so there's not going to be a Russian reset under uh, Joe Biden as a president. Uh, quite the contrary. He said that we need uh, essentially deter Russia. We need to have more activities in this region, taking into account what's happening in Belarus, taking mm -hmm. into account what Russia has been doing over the last um, four years. Yeah. Because with uh, Trump as a president, uh, so. Putin did stuff, interfered in U.S. elections, um, 
uh, poisoned Navalny, other things. Um, so actually, the kind of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine hasn't stopped. So there's still this low-level frozen conflict in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and Trump was essentially like, well, whatever, you know, you, Russian was involved in an election, I don't really care about it. Uh, so Navalny, uh, it's not an issue for Trump. Uh, so basically Trump gave Russia a kind of kind of carte blanche. So mm -hmm. do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not do whatever you want, but you can do things. I'm not going to kind of call you out. I'm not going to kind of react to any of uh, kind of the, these aggressive foreign policy actions. Definitely that's going to stop with uh, Joe Biden. So definitely Russia is not going to be probably, well, unless something happens, uh, Russia is not going to be first priority for him and for, 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 for also for, for NATO, uh, but definitely it's going to become more important for U.S. Uh, administration under Joe Biden. Uh, and, and for NATO, next four years, so definitely Russia, one major, major block uh, of NATO attention. But at the same time, NATO has been talking about this kind of, you know, 30, uh, 60, 360 degree approach to, to, to well, kind of global issues. Mm -hmm. So Arctic with Russia involved, uh, also a big issue for NATO. Uh, cyber defense, um, only becoming bigger and bigger issue for, for kind of, kind of well, this century and next decades. Uh, Mediterranean for other NATO countries, and that's, that's kind of the, the essence of NATO. It's not just Russia. These all issues are important for all member states. Uh, we can, well, not we, but NATO alliance can work on all of these. It's not just, just kind of this one uh, issue uh, agenda. It's uh, being prepared and being ready for all the... Um, the kind of challenges of the 21st century, and that's that's and NATO has the capabilities, mm -hmm. NATO has the, the money, the resources uh, to, to to deal with all of these things as the most powerful alliance in the history of the world, but um, I mean the, the, the one of the biggest challenges is how to one what with the leaders of NATO have been talking about is uh, smart defense. We have all these capabilities, we have largest defense budget in the world. If you take not just US but all the NATO member states, it's by far bigger than, than yeah. that of China and, and if you can't even compare that with Russia. Russia is a small country compared to kind of NATO and military spending. And uh, so yeah, how to make, how to use these resources smarter. So, so we don't have to essentially waste uh, money on having similar capabilities, how we can pool capabilities, how we can essentially uh, get more for the buck, as, as Americans uh, would, would say it. And that's also this, this very big, 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 uh, well, kind of, kind of, yeah, well, essentially, yeah, challenge and a, a opportunity for NATO in the next <laughs> four years and next decades. But again, this, this, is, this is very vague. Under all these words, there are specific missions, there are specific things NATO is doing. So, for example, and this is more United States than, than, than NATO. A uh, big deal for, for uh, Baltic states and Central Eastern Europe is a uh, pre-positioning of U.S. equipment in the Baltics and in Poland. Uh, I don't know where and how much. No one knows. Uh, but there's a lot of money spent by United States on this. Uh, that's still definitely still going to continue. So U.S. equipment here on the ground, just in case something happens, U.S. doesn't have to transport uh, basically tanks. And, and I think and you, have, you have uh, talked about this tripwire effect also. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's, that's the idea. If you have essentially equipment here, if you have nothing here, if, if the worst case scenario happens, um, well, it's hard to defend Baltics. Mm -hmm. If you already have a tro troops equipment here, if you have trained with the Baltic, uh, kind of, well, this is the idea of NATO battle groups. So in Latvia, the NATO battle group is integrated in defense planning. So we already have plans in place if something happens, uh, if, if basically worst scenario, case scenario happens, that's, that's, that's well, we're prepared for this, mm -hmm. at least to some extent. And uh, that's the idea of essentially kind of NATO of defense planning, prepare for the worst uh, and hope for the best. And if you are ready for the worst case scenarios, your uh, potential adversary is going to think uh, more than twice uh, to do something crazy and uh, radical. And again, so you also can see very, very well how these, um, well, how different issues are securitized uh, in, in kind of international relations. So uh, kind of Russia has gone down on international agenda over the last years. Nothing really has changed. Russia has the same amount of troops uh, in, in, in the border of Baltic states. Uh, so eastern Ukraine uh, is still in kind of Russian hands. The conflict hasn't died, 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 died down. But we have more pressing issues. We have COVID. We have essentially kind of chaos. Trump picking fights with NATO and, and so on. And uh, so we are definitely kind of kind of this Russian threat because has died down from from kind of the attention of media and also within society. NATO is still planning kind of, kind of these contingency strategies, mm -hmm. increasing presence. Military planners are on this. Uh, that's great. But definitely, if you look at kind of kind of on the top of the agenda. So Russia definitely lower than it was uh, like in 2014, 2016, although nothing has really, really changed uh, in kind of this military calculus on the ground in Kaliningrad and the border of uh, NATO and the border of Baltic states. You did your master's in New York University, right? Um, 
why did you choose New York University and how does it change your like understanding living there about the United States? Yeah, well, well. Uh, so the first time I went to the U.S., uh, there was this Ina Gale scholarship uh, and this was uh, for uh, one specific university, University of Wisconsin, you know, Claire, uh, this, this small town. And um, I know it was kind of, you know, the, the real America. Uh, so mm -hmm. very rural. Uh, my uh, roommate, I lived in dorms. My roommate shot a bear and you know, wow. bear chili. You know, this kind of real America. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, it, and it was quite interesting because the state was divided. So 50-50 Republicans, Democrats. So I could see like the both worlds. Because in New York, it's, it's totally Democrat. And uh, that, was, that, that was quite a unique experience to see, see you know, see... Well, as I said, the real America, uh, and then in New York, it's it's more of a uh, uh, well, total, totally, totally different, uh, and 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 so so so, so for, first of all, studying in U.S., uh, also in Wisconsin, so so in in Latvia, uh, at least in the uh, University of Latvia, Department of Social Sciences, uh, they gave a very good kind of theoretical basis of of all kind of you know political science theories, IR, mm -hmm. what's happening in the world. And that's great. Uh, so at least my kind of education in, in Latvia was, was was pretty 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 decent uh, the, in the undergraduate uh, level. And uh, then uh, what is different in U.S. You can have access to people who've done things and who've been to places. I don't know a, a lecturer who was a contractor in Afghanistan, a guy who works in CIA, a former speechwriter for Congress, and, and so on and so on. A former. Uh, Diplomat uh, to uh, the ambassador to China, mm -hmm. so so people who've done things uh, and who can kind of join this this theoretical approach with 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 uh, the real world, and it gives much 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 uh, more uh, than just uh, these, these these kind of theories. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one thing. The other thing is uh, we also had uh, people who developed these theories. Uh, there was this. Uh, uh, his last name was Brams, I think Stephen Brams, uh, Brams, this guy who developed one of these kind of game theories, uh, like subset theories. And uh, and that's also very, very interesting to, to, so one thing is, you know, like the, the lecturer has read about the, the theory, the, he's retelling, you know, the, the story about the theory, and there's this guy who developed it, and he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's kind of, you know, this first-hand approach. Um, there was one part, the other part was that overall in New York, uh, so basically, well, a lot of events, you know, like presidents from all across the world, leaders from all across the world, top-notch speakers talking about these issues, uh, and that, that's quite an experience. Uh, and, and again, and again, there are there's also a downside. Now in Latvia, it's very hard for me to go to call the kind of political discussion because they're so dry and boring, and and, and, and uh. just yeah. Because in U.S., if you in U.S., the competition is ex extreme. So if you become a I know a director of a think tank or, or kind of well-known speaker, you are very, very good. In Latvia, so a lot of kind of even politicians who are in charge of things, they're not good public, public, public speakers. Uh, and in the U.S., it's much harder to kind of get places and achieve things. You have to be really, really good. Uh, at, at the, on, at the, on the other hand, uh, if you are a kind of political science student in the in, 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 in U.S., it is much harder to achieve something because my former uh, kind of kind of people who I studied with in New York University, uh, who wanted to work in think tanks or in administration, so uh, they were happy to get like the lowest possible job making you know coffee or printing things, because in U.S. if you have graduated from top thirty university in the world, uh, it doesn't mean anything because everyone in Washington has graduated from top thirty university True. <laughs> in the world, so uh, that that's also another thing that kind of kind of totally different scale and 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 and, and um, kind of more global approach uh, and more um, different this 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 uh, perspective on on the world that that's that's given. So that's that's also that's actually if if, if you're a student uh, in RGSL or anywhere, so this international experience is definitely totally worth it, even in Erasmus, uh, in the U.S. even more so, because there is a difference between um, studying in, in Latvia and, and or, or, or you know, I mean, even, even, in, even in Germany or France. Uh, if you study in U.S., uh, the debate is about global issues. So basically, U.S., what can U.S. do on this issue? So if you study in Latvia and France, uh, there's different, different, different scale, different level. Uh, we're not going to... Well, you can theoretically discuss it, but in U.S., it is much, much, much kind of more realistic. So, well, if you are American, essentially students, um, because most of the students were American, so okay, you're going to go work for whatever institution. You probably one of you is going to get in a decent post. You might work on this. So, what would you do in the situation in Iraq or whatever? There's definitely more credibility, more kind of, kind of this, this, 
sense of not urgency, but sense of uh, that this is real. Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. not just discussing theoretically here in Latvia, you know, what would you do? This is more realistic and more, so there are, there are real stakes, especially if the person who's teaching you has actually been in Iraq and has mm -hmm. dealt with this issue uh, herself. Um, yeah, that's, 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 uh, so yeah, that's, 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 that's quite, quite an experience that, that gives you additional, uh, both theoretical and practical insight. Another thing is that, um, well, so if, if, you, if you compare, so, so I was lucky, so my education in Latvia was, mm -hmm. was quite good. Um, there are a lot of problems with the education system in Latvia. In New York University was the first time when I kind of really studied, uh, like we had to read thousands of pages for every week. We didn't read everything, but still we tried to. We came together as a group of students, you know, like in movies, we came together as, as a group of students, discussed uh, so, so this crazy professor in game theory, what he told us, extremely complicated. Now we come together and then we discuss, okay, what does this mean? <laughs> how we can pass mm -hmm. his exam? So that was also very good, this academic environment, this, this real challenging, because uh, in Latvia, a lot of students, they work uh, in addition to the education, the, 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 the studies, a lot of students, they, they study, but they don't really care about the studies, so that was a big change. So kind of motivated, really interested and engaged group with this kind of real university experience. And, uh, and, and all, all of this, all of this kind of leaves, leaves uh, well, hopefully, <laughs> leaves a mark on your uh, future career and, and, and how, you, how you overall can approach you know, your, your work, your career, your, 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 your you know, skill set, and, uh, and, and so mm -hmm. on. This, this, uh, because um, in Latvia, as I said, so education system, there are a lot of problems. There definitely are some um, kind of post-Soviet things that are still left in our education system. And then if you see that things can be done differently, uh, that this is uh, simply our way of doing things in academia, but not only academia, and kind of, kind of, um, or even in administration of university or, or, or other, other kind of aspects of, but not just university overall. You live in your society. You think that this is this is normal how we do mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. You live abroad. You see that well. This is just one way how we live here. You, you can also structure a society in yeah. kind of more open way or more more or I know different ways. Uh, well, you say your time at New York University uh, inspired you to become an academic. Um, not well, not well, not really. I uh, already before I had decided that I want to pursue this academic career. What moved me in this direction is, uh, so I, I started studies uh, in the first big crisis in Latvia, so 20, uh, nine, 2009, we had this financial crisis and I started studies, I think in 2008. Uh, and uh, so during this financial crisis, so in, in Latvia and media and in society, similar to now, there are conspiracies going around, there's this kind of, kind of, kind of, this, this sense of, you know, craziness and mm -hmm. a lot of crazy political commentary. And uh, in university, it was very kind of evidence-based, rational, this, this down to earth, you know, econ economy goes in, 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 in this, this, this ups and downs, it's systemic uh, circles, uh, this is normal, this is nothing that, that you know, unique and crazy, you know, this kind of fact-based, evidence-based, rational, scientific approach to the world, and that, that talked to me quite, quite a lot, uh, that resonated with me, with me a lot, and um, kind of very early on, I decided that, that this is something I want to wanna kind of move yeah. uh, in this direction, and... Uh, and, and and if you if you decide what kind of direction of your life well not uh, well, yeah this is a very philosophical direction of your life is going to be so you 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 move in that direction mm -hmm. and then i don't know you start a i don't know a, a, a kind of i don't know a, a podcast or or I don't know, video log yeah. uh, you meet new people you have new new acquaintances of opportunities new possibilities you get some i don't know someone offer you a kind of kind of potential of collaboration in some research project. If you move in this direction, then sooner or later, there are gonna be possibilities that are gonna open up uh, over time. Uh, if you are um, you know, sitting at home and, and wishing for things to happen, it's not gonna happen. If you're moving in a direction, uh, then, then, cause that's also, I didn't, uh, when I was a student in uh, University of Latvia, I didn't organize a, a kind of this, this know, video format, but we had a discussions with our uh, teachers uh, after, outside of lectures. So basically there's a cool a lecturer we had mm -hmm. so when I was organizing this so we had him in a small uh, like a room around the table with the students who wanted to ask them questions uh, not just about academic stuff not about the lectures what they were telling us but about you know, for example we had Nils Muzhniks we talked about his political and oh. then academic career uh, we had also other people to talk about these kind of more more engaged and then I organized kind of these also NGO events and so on but this, that's the idea you start moving in this direction and then well 
sooner or later. Uh, of course, you might get unlucky and nothing happens, but still the possibility that, that something kind of works out uh, is much, much higher mm -hmm. with more you do. So if you make these events, the, the, the possibility goes up. Uh, if you study abroad, it also increases your chances of kind of, you know, succeeding <laughs> at yeah. life. And uh, so, yeah, definitely that's, that's, that's a, um, so, uh, and well, to some extent, yes, that, that's kind of, well, every person, and this is what I kind of, my philosophy of life, Every person, you are responsible for your own life. You're trying, gonna try to do more. You're gonna be more active. You increase the possibility of, of you succeeding at life. Uh, and, and, and again, what succeeding means, it's totally different for each person. But still, if you are gonna be active, if you're gonna do things in the direction that you wanna do it, uh, well, you're more far more likely than uh, well achieve things you wanna achieve, whatever that is, uh, than, than, yeah. than if you simply sit at home and, and um, well, Yes, <laughs> I always like the allegory of fishing because you know it's your it, you just do the thing. I don't know how it is in English, but and then you just wait, right? You mm -hmm. wait. You mm -hmm. if it doesn't mm -hmm. work, you repeat. Yeah, you, you change repeat, something. Yeah, yeah you, and mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, after some waiting, it will something may you know may catch well, you the bait. You increase the possibility. Then then yeah. if you, if essentially if you're doing the same thing again and again, it's not working. It's it's probably not going to work. If you're not fishing at all, you're not going to yeah. catch a fish. Uh, that's that's. Uh, and again, it, of course, and that's not, not, it's not that simple. Uh, and again, this, this, so I, I, I painted this very rosy picture. You know, I studied, it was amazing and so on. Yeah. <laughs> and it was also very stressful because <laughs> getting in, in university in the U.S., it's a not very that easy. University. It's, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to, uh, it's a, there, you have to pass the GRE test, which is uh, English and then math, and it's very hard. And again, you have to get funding. Extremely anxious because yeah. uh, I was accepted in university. So I was accepted in, uh, so I did so. I did the GRE, the test. You, you have to do this, this test. It simply applied to universities in US in graduate studies. Uh, I, I did the test, good results, uh, especially in math. Uh, and, and, and this is important for US universities. You have to be good in math because here we have very kind of, you know, this, this soft kind of kind of qualitative studies in, in there. There was also some math involved in, mm -hmm. in studies, uh, which is which is great. A uh, different approach than, than we have here in Latvia. And um, so yeah, and then I did the GRE, then I applied to, to Columbia and to New York University. I got accepted to both, but uh, I didn't get the funding in the first year I applied to scholarships, didn't get them. Extremely anxious because, you know, I've achieved this, yeah. this, this dream almost, got, gotten like there, but I don't get the funding. But then it's extremely anxious, anxious and stressful. But then I, then I find out about this possibility that if I have been admitted, I can ask uh, to, to delay the start of my studies for one year. So I have a right to both universities, the, mm -hmm. the Columbia and New York University. Uh, so Columbia says no. New York says yes, we can defer your, your admission for one year. So I have an additional year to get the funding. So I apply to, to, to Buff, to Fulbright, and That's a couple other things. And uh, thankfully, in the end, I got the Buff scholarship. But still, it's, 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 it's extremely, well, it is hard. It's it is stressful. stressful. It is stressful. Not, not easy. But, it, but that's the thing. Well, not, nothing. Like if, so, we don't, I'm not going to say nothing. So, saying staying at home, uh, I don't know, I don't know, playing video games, watching movies, that's easy. <laughs> but if you want to achieve something, there's no way. It's going to be hard. It's, it's there's competition. There are people who want to achieve things. Uh, there's no no way around it. Um, very rarely you just get lucky and, and you know things just happen. That's also of course a chance for anyone. Yeah, but uh, the more you do, the more you go through stress. Uh, and again, with so at the, that time, that seemed very stressful. Now, as you progress, like that seems that, now that now that it. seems yeah. easy, you know, like right, I can apply to university in US any time. No, it's not, <laughs> it's not not that hard, and that's also why I've tried, and also in RGSL and elsewhere, I, I've helped a couple of students to apply for scholarships to get to study abroad or mm -hmm. for internships abroad, because uh, because once you've done it, you've developed a skill or, or some knowledge, and then you can move on to some more well, now more more stressful new <laughs> things. Yeah. And again, but it, it kind of gets easier. So in, with, with time, initially when you start kind of working on on whatever mm -hmm. kind of commenting stuff on, on media or analyzing US foreign policy, for example. Initially, it is, uh, well, it is very hard. You have to read a lot. You have to kind of understand, well, basically all the terms, all the kind of insider story. Now, for me, if something happens in the US, so I already have this kind of background knowledge. Well, this is this, this is this, this is that actor, that actor. So now something new happens, uh, I already kind of, kind of, kind of have Just this build kind up. of... 
yes, I have these bases. I can build up kind of, kind of, kind of this, this, this more in-depth kind of, kind of knowledge of what's happening based on what all the previous things that I've had. And if you're interested in politics, uh, so if you like uh, reading books, for example, Game of Thrones, then following U.S. domestic and foreign policy is like reading uh, mm -hmm. Game of Thrones. It is more complicated. It's not you know well written very often. It's very confusing at times, but it's extremely interesting if you 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 really start understanding what's uh, happening. And again and again, I so in Latvia, I'm an expert in U.S. kind of kind of politics. In U.S., I I'm not an expert. So in U.S., there are people who are far more knowledgeable than I am, definitely. But again, uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a, this is a journey for, for everyone to kind of to, to move up in this kind of academic or mm -hmm. letter or expertise on a specific topic. Uh, so and that's again it, th th this is another thing that you talked, asked about studies. So even the, like the top experts in Latvia and, and on many issues. Uh, so in U.S. Uh, so our top experts don't hold a candle to a couple of people in U.S. <laughs> who are just you listening to them. It's like whoa, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's a uh, yeah very 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 next level of. Um, of kind of political analysis and expertise. I know that we have uh, <laughs> talked a lot, yes, of course. Uh, perhaps uh, a few words, only a few words perhaps about your time alongside studying in the permanent mission of the Latvia. You stayed loyal to Latvia when you were <laughs> studying at NYU. So yeah, uh, I, I, uh, so I had to have, have, an, have an internship uh, with my master's degree. And, uh, well, an internship at the permanent mission of Latvia United Nations in New York. And uh, so the, uh, and again, this is about the, the, well, both luck and also this, you know, doing things, uh, kind of proving yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was there in uh, 2000, I think, when was it, 13, 14, a bit after financial crisis. And uh, Latvia is going out of financial crisis and the mission to United Nations is understaffed. I think there were four people working there. And uh, so I'm there in, in New York University, and I, I write them, uh, hey, well, I'm studying here. I've done these things. So are you interested in, in having me as, as an intern there? Uh, and uh, so uh, one thing is that I've done these things. I've studied, you know, I have an NGO activities and so mm -hmm. on. So I could say that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be you know, useless. You're not going to have to like, train me all the time. You know, I can yeah. do things. Yeah. Uh, that's one part. The other part was simply luck. Uh, so they had four people working there. They simply couldn't attend all the meetings that are taking place in the United Nations. Yeah. So, uh, and I, well, for the most part, what I did, I went to, to UN meetings. I didn't represent Latvia. I'm not a diplomat, but I was taking notes. I was sitting under the table uh, after, in, uh, after behind this, this Latvia note, and I was taking notes. So, you know, this is position of uh, Russia, this position of US, that's UK, and so on, and reporting to, 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 to my superiors in the UN, uh, uh, Latvian mission to UN. Mm -hmm. So, kind of this, 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 um, uh, uh, kind of very basic uh, task, but at the same time, very, very insightful. You could see how basically diplomacy happens on the world stage. Uh, the upsides and downsides, uh, the downsides, for example, that these meetings are extremely long and the, all the missions, they say the same thing, more or less. Uh, and very they can't, formal. Yeah, yeah, very formal, yeah. But but at the same time, when you understand, so there were UN, UN kind of these, these uh, meetings, there were also meetings of European Union, uh, and then there were diplomats who had worked there for uh, 10, 20 years who explained, okay, we had a meeting where we were debating this one definition for three hours. This is very important because A, B, and C is going to have implications on this, this, and this. It's not, you know, it's not <laughs> a, a useless d discussion on how to define, I don't remember what, but, but some, some concept. It is extremely uh, significant decision because if how we define it is going to influence uh, this project, this next 10 years, and, and so on and so on. Uh, quite, quite, quite a unique uh, experience. Uh, but again, as I said, so on one hand, this, you've done something, you've achieved something. On the other hand, you simply get get uh, lucky uh, that you're in the right place mm -hmm. at the right time. Uh, but again, you increase your possibilities to get, uh, well, in this case, accepted for internship uh, by, by doing things uh, beforehand. Um, maybe, lastly, you have a question to us or maybe something you want to say to our listeners. Um, well, I think I think this whole last part was was talking to the listeners. Uh, so essentially, mm -hmm. the more you uh, the more you kind of uh, invest in your future, uh, the more likely you're 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 to get some returns uh, that are going to be essentially uh, essentially you know, achieving your dreams and goals and so on. Mm -hmm. I think that's the summary of kind of this last part of what we've talked about. Uh, that that. Um, that, uh, that, that well, uh, that's one part. And the other part that I mentioned this a little bit as well. So. So you are responsible for your kind of life and career, and, and I've tried to think kind of this strategically. 
So, uh, and again, I didn't come up with this. I was, was kind of, one of this advice, uh, kind of my mentor, mentor gave, gave to me at one point, but uh, you have to think how you can sell your knowledge or skills uh, to, to the I don't know, to media, to, to potential employ employers, uh, to, to whatever you want to do in your life, because uh, it, it doesn't happen on your own. Before I started commenting in media, I simply asked a couple of uh, journalists I knew in Tevinet and Delphi, hey, I know something about US, hey, can I write this article? Of course, for free and you know it's my job and it's my free time but you know trying to show yourself that you are you know this, this person who is a graduate at the University of New York uh, and, and knows something more than, than, than other people you know and, and kind of trying to show uh, yourself uh, also to sell yourself <laughs> to, to the domestic uh, audience uh, so yeah that's well, yeah, yeah, that is that is, that's that's yeah, one way of looking at it, and it's 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 not easy. It takes time. It's, it's strategic. Uh, there are setbacks, uh, you know. As I said, so you know, not getting a scholarship, but getting <laughs> stop university, uh, but it's totally worth it in the end. Uh, it, it might be hard, but it's uh, worth uh, trying because uh, essentially, you know, you know, it, it, basically, life is I don't know a, a ride, uh, and you can uh, decide what you want to do with it, uh, and you can have fun with it. Uh, it. It's hard sometimes, yes, but it's up to you what's gonna come out of it. Uh, that's uh, that's as philosophical as I'm gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think this is a very great, insightful episode for our listeners. I hope that yes. it was very inspiring because it was for me. Yes, definitely and, inspiring, and amazing. And <laughs> great. Thank, thank you. Also, Thanks. also very exclusive on Trump. I hope this is one of the last times you need to <laughs> talk so thoroughly about Trump. Well, no, no. This was this is more more about kind of these political issues, the big, what, what, like the big, big, big themes. It was not you know Trump said this, so what does it mean? You know, you see now start revolt. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, this, okay. this, this more, is more you know, like reflection, yes, perhaps. Yes, more on, kind on of on the, four on years. Four years and, yeah. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah, and I, I, I'm very, very glad that you you were here. We're all glad I, to be here. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.